Now if we could turn to 1 Peter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse, verse 30. So that's 1 Peter 1, 1 to 30. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, exiles of the diaspora, dispersion, in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of, the, of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you, have, you, though you do not know, now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent, subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. In the things that, now, that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, Things into which angels long to look. Right. Now let us go back in time to the 19th of July, AD 64. Yeah, you can all remember it, can't you? Yeah. On that day in Rome, a fire started. The problem was that most of the houses were built of wood. For the next four days, the fire raged uncontrollably. They managed to get it under control. Then after a couple of days, it raged again. For 10 days. Let's hope the coronavirus doesn't do that. Eh? <laughs> now Nero was the emperor at the time. And watched from his balcony in safety. And apparently he loved it. Indeed he said something like this. Look 
at those lovely flames. They're as charming as flowers. Now Nero had great ambitions for the city of Rome, looking over the burning city, set his imagination going, that he could now build the city he wanted. But public opinion, as it does, began to get busy. When he heard of, when they heard of his enjoyment at the flames, they began to say that Nero had started it himself. So that he could follow his building plans. So Nero found himself very unpopular. Nero needed a scapegoat. Someone who could be blamed and move the people's suspicions away from him. Our Roman historian, Tacitus, writes this account. Neither human assistance in the shape of imperial gifts, that is to the homeless, nor attempts to appease the gods by offering sacrifice, could remove the sinister report that the fire was due to Nero's own orders. So, in the hope of uh, dissipating the rumours, he falsely diverted the charge onto a set of people to whom the vulgar gave the name of Christians and who were de detested for the abominations they perpetuated. The founder of this sect, Jesus Christ by name, had been executed by Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius and the dangerous superstition though put down for the moment broke out again not only in Judah but even in Rome where everything shameful and horrible collects and is practiced now when people hear little bits about Christianity about Christians and what they do things can get twisted for people heard that they they ate someone's body and they drank someone's blood whenever they met and that made good headlines can you imagine the press today they'll have a field day won't they well, I don't think it was any different in those days. So the headlines would have read, cannibals have come to Rome. It was said they held love feasts and they saluted one another with kisses. So they were accused of foul and immoral orgies. They were also accused of preaching that the world was to be dissolved in fire. And surely they were trying to prove what they had preached by setting Rome on fire. So you can see how Nero twisted it. He thought, hmm, I can work with that. Just like the press today. So hence the persecutions began against the Church of God. Peter here is writing to those Jews who have fled from the persecution and move to the Gentile world to seek peace and safety. It's hard to us to fully appreciate persecution. That causes fear in our hearts. And forces you to leave everything and move to a different country. Unfortunately, lots of people today have or are having that very experience. Thankfully, we live in a country that has good law and order, and we still have freedom to worship Jesus. Now, if they'd gone somewhere where maybe there was a church already, they would have got support, of course, from fellow believers. But Peter's writing to them to encourage them to stick to their teachings. 
and continue their lives in Christ. They are now representing Jesus in the areas where they are, where they are living, and must be good examples to others. Now, having been born again to a living hope, they are to imitate the Holy One, who has called them. They need to learn some mission in all things, so they can rejoice as partakers of the suffering of Christ. That response to life is truly the climax of one's submission to the good hand of God. Now when I started writing this, I was expecting to get quite a way through the chapter. But then I bumped into verses 1 and 2. That's it, when you're, when you're starting a sermon, you think, oh yeah, I've got that. And then you start. And you don't get there. <laughs> you get what you get what God wants to give. You know. So let's look at verse one and two. So Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit, for grace to you and peace be multiplied. So Peter, he starts his letter stating who he is and what he is, making sure the people receiving the letter knew that the contents of this letter could be trusted. I think about it today when you receive an email. You have to be very careful who it's from. I tend to only open the ones I know who it's from. So if you send me an email, I don't know who it's from, it won't get on. And then if you wonder why I haven't read it, that's the reason. But in those days... Now, there's a chance that some of the people in the churches will have known of Peter. Because he was writing to the people of the dispersion. In other words, people who had moved away to avoid persecution and settle all over Asia Minor. This letter was not just to one church, as we've seen. It's to many churches to Pontius, to Galatia, to Cappadocia, to Asia, and Bithynia. But it was sent to the pil it was sent to the pilgrims of the gentle churches with a message of hope to the people of God, who had suffered persecution and could expect further and even worse persecution to come. So, the use of pilgrims refers to a people on a journey through this world. Not of this world, separated from it, but having to journey through it. We are to store our treasures in heaven, not on this earth. Listen to this amazing description of an early of the early Christians I came across in a letter written by a man called Diognetius I doubt very much whether it's pronounced like that but if you want the spelling I can give it you afterwards he wrote Christians are marked out from the rest of mankind by their country or their speech or their customs they dwell in cities, both Greek and barbarian. Each has his lot is cast. Following the customs of that region in clothing, food, and in the outward things of life generally. Yet, they manifest the wonderful and openly paradoxical character of their own state. They inhabit the land of their birth, 
but as temporary residents thereof. They take their share of all responsibilities as citizens and endure all the disabilities as aliens. Every foreign land is their native land and every native land is a foreign land. They pass their days upon earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. Well, that's us, by the way, all of us. So this sums up our time on this earth very well. No matter where we live, no matter where we call home, that is not our final destination. Yes, we live according to the ways the locals live, but we will always feel as aliens in the land. This is not where our heart is. That's in heaven. So we can't feel totally at peace where we live. But we can feel at peace with those who feel the same around us. Have you ever noticed how you prefer to have the company of Christians? All the time. I mean, on the campsite we're on, everybody's flooded in now. You know, and it's nice to have other people to talk to, other than the birds and Sue. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong talking to Sue, but you know what I mean. But you don't fit in with them. You know, they their life is different. And you'll know within your families, maybe not you, because they're all Christians, so you're lucky. I was brought up with the same sort of family. But if your family aren't Christians, you can you can have different paths, you know, and it, 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 you feel a bit estranged from them. Right. Persecution can cause different reactions in different people. Some fall away because it's too much for them to handle. Others grow and become stronger. And those who truly find peace in all circumstances rejoice that they can share in the suffering of Jesus Christ. When we see Christians suffering for their faith, even unto death, and they are still praising God, I think, would I be that strong in that situation? One hopes that I would. But of course the difference is the Holy Spirit. That strengthens us, strength, strengthens us when we need it. Excuse me a minute. Right. Elect according to the foreknowledge of of God the Father. Well, elect, are we chosen to be part of a people? I'm not really going to go into that because that is a massive subject and <laughs> yeah, I'll leave that up to Jason. Uh, uh, that has been elected by the Father beforehand. How can that be? How can an almighty God know about poor little old me? I'm a nobody, you know? But almighty God still is, inter still is interested. Why would he choose me? I've never done anything great. Maybe it could have something to do with the heart. God knows who will be obedient to him. In reality, nobody knows exactly why he chooses who he chooses. Only God the Father knows that. So we are elected according to the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, sanctification 
and the word holy of the same root in Greek. It means to separate or to set apart. The here the teaching from Peter is that every Christian should be strangers in this world. The way the world operates and tries to control what we think, what we do, and what we say should be totally opposite to the way we are. The evil worldly system stands in direct opposition to what God stands for. You can have, cannot have a foot in both camps. You're either for God or against him. And never, never the two should meet. In 1 John 2, 15 to 17, he says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of the Father, does the will of God, abides forever. It's all about being obedient to God and his ways. I know as sinners born to sin, it's, it's impossible to achieve perfection in Christ. Has anybody managed it this week, by the way? No? I know I haven't. But by separating ourselves in the way we think and live, we can go a long way towards it. Now, when you work in the worldly system, it's very difficult to set yourself apart. I know I worked in a factory for, for many years, but we can try, and through continually adjusting ourselves, we can get through. And I will admit that when you retire, it gets slightly easier. I should imagine pastors as well, you know, because they're so immersed every day in doing things for God. But they have more contact with the world. So, I don't know. Anyway, yes. Now, the term spring... Sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, in verse 2, is most interesting. Those with a knowledge of the Old Testament are familiar with their traditions, but those who don't study it will not appreciate the significance of this statement. This letter is written to Gentile churches, so it could have been difficult for them to understand. But of course... If they had the people from the dispor diaspora in these churches, they could explain it to them. We see this happen on three occasions in the Old Testament. So let's have a look at them. This is the sprinkling of the blood. In Leviticus 14, 1 to 7. Cleansing. When a leper was healed he or she was sprinkled with the blood of a bird. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take him who is to be cleansed, two living and clean birds, cedarwood, scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel with overrunning water. And as for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedarwood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood 
of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy. And he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in an open field. The second time is setting apart for service for God. In Exodus 29, 20 to 22. Aaron, the priest and the, of the tabernacle, was sprinkling with blood on the of the sacrificial lamb when they were sanctified for their priestly service. So Exodus. Then you shall kill the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of the right ear of his sons and on the thumb on their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood all around the altar and you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments and on his, son, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him and he and his garments shall be hallowed and the son's garments with him and finally obedience to God's covenant that is Exodus 24 6 to 8 when the people of Israel responded to God's invitation to establish a covenant with him Moses sprinkled half the blood of the oxen on the people and half on the altar. And the people stated, all that the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses took half the blood and put it in a basin and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these. The key word is obey. Now in verse 2 we see the, it shows us that the Trinity here is the Father who has chosen and exercised foreknowledge, the Holy Spirit who has set believers apart from sin and Jesus the Messiah who is to be the object of obedience and is the one whose blood is sprinkled. Set apart by the Spirit for obedience to Jesus the Messiah. Yetchel Lichtenstein writes, it also relates to the word chosen. The meaning is that because they have trust, God helps them by his Holy Spirit. So they will obey the gospel and commit themselves to it with all their heart. Thus are they set apart from sin. Sprinkled of his blood is also mentioned three times in Romans. And under the Mosaic covenant, blood represents both death and life. Because the life is in the blood. Leviticus 17.11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Hebrews 9.22 says this, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. And finally, 1 John 1.7 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us all from sin. From all sin, sorry. Now then, a 
I've said that word again. Number three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us and again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now we look to Jesus, our Lord, the one who we trust, the one who died for us, not just died for us, but died in our place. The one who we owe everything to. But here Peter is saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that God is the one who sent Jesus to live on earth, on this earth and live amongst us but you know some people out there including some Christians seem to stop at just Jesus there's the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit there's three of them in the Godhead let us not forget that so the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has shown us That's you and me. Abundant mercy. Not just mercy, but abundant mercy. Here is the almighty God, the God of creation, showing abundant mercy to you and me. Why is the living God interested in us? Why does he want to give us a gift so awesome that we struggle to see how special it is? So through his abundant mercy, he has begotten us again. In effect, we are born again of the Spirit to enjoy a living hope. And how do we get this hope, this awesome gift from God? It is through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. So by Jesus dying on the cross in our place, we have a hope. Not only dying, it's dying and resurrecting from the dead. Is why we have that living hope. Not just, oh, I hope it's good enough, I'm good enough to get into heaven, or I hope I've done enough, to get into heaven but a true and secure hope that we will get into heaven and by the way I have heard that from people oh I just hope I'm good enough to get into heaven and you think you're on the wrong track mate we all my own, when it's your boss saying it it's a bit difficult to fire back at them isn't it we all have an in inheritance, not like the inheritance we get on earth that eventually disappears. When we pass on from this earthly realm, but an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled. One that does not fade away, one that is reserved in heaven for you, for you. For you and me. After all, we are called in Matthew 16, 19 and 20. Sorry, Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Do not lay upon, lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. So this living hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, 
He's kept in heaven by the power of God. No one or not one thing can touch it. It's not a, it's not a garment you put away, then many years you find it to think, oh, I'll wear that. And then when you hold it up, it becomes a holy garment. Hmm. Oh, not of the right holy garment anyway. <laughs> I've lost my place now, haven't I? Oh, yeah. So you become a Christian at 20, say. That living hope is stored by God. And when you die, hopefully about 100, if you're lucky, or even later if you're really lucky, that hope will not be corrupted in any way. It will be just the same. So in the last times when you come before the judgment seat, it will be still bright and shining as the day it first appeared. And that applies to all your treasures that you store in heaven. And how do we get these treasures? By being obedient to God, God's will in your life. You don't have to be perfect, just trying our best to follow his word. Six. And seven. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, everyone should rejoice in that hope. But unfortunately, we have to live here on earth for a short while. When I mean short while, I mean 100 years or so. But in the big scheme of things, that's a short while. During this time, we are tested and face trials. I'm sure we've all been through them. And we're going through one at the moment. It's not really a big trial, but it's still a trial. Now, life is no bed of roses for Christians. Why can't we just go straight to heaven? Imagine that, eh? You get saved, you're up there. It'd be great, wouldn't it? But you can't. Why? The answer is because our faith is to be refined and shown to be genuine. Your faith is the most precious thing you will ever own. Gold is nothing next to it. Diamonds are but glass. Yes, just, just like that. If that were made out of pure diamonds, it would be just a glass. A genuine faith may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we are all on a journey. We are all refined as we walk along. So don't despise the trials of life. Look upon them as a refining. That God is refining your faith. I'm sure everybody will find, from now on, will find tests and trials of think, ah, that's easy. I'm just being refined, won't you? It doesn't work that way, unfortunately, as we all know. Every time you are tested by fire, you come out the other side closer to the Almighty God. Now, on the surface, I'm not doing a, a good job selling this faith to people, am I, out there? But when you think about it, we are on about eternity. Not just next week or next month or even next year. But not expecting. By not expecting. Hang on. Oh. 
Well, it's a lot of things looking a bit blurred. <laughs> well, they're better than bifocals because um, they just send me completely then. Right. But not accepting, sounds better, doesn't it? Jesus as your saviour, you are missing out on so much that your future depends on it. Eight. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. There we have it. By believing in someone you can't see in the flesh now, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Why? Because in the end we get our reward. The salvation of our souls. Wow, that's, that, that's a promise, is that it? Eh? It's a fantastic promise, that. That the God of creation is offering us all this. The God of creation wants us to live with him forever. Can you imagine that? I don't know about you, but that is something I definitely want. How about you? And you? And you? I'm saying that, but you all know that. <laughs> but remember, when life gives you a hundred reasons to break down and cry... Show life a million reasons to smile and laugh. And of course, they all revolve around Jesus Christ. 10, 11, and 12. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering. The things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. Why do you think so much of the New Testament is found in the Old? It's because the message they were preaching, it was not just some new, new found thing. He hadn't, God hadn't just made it up. The message was there, they were bringing, was based on the teachings of the Old Testament. The prophets of old inquired into this salvation that is being offered to you. The prophets who were people who God spoke through and prophesied about these things long before they happened. They wanted to know about it. Because it was being offered to people in the future, understanding this makes us see that this was God's plan all along and not something that he has just brought in. Because he thought it was a good idea at the time. We must remember that the people this letter was aimed at were being afflicted. So this message was aimed to encourage them, knowing that it was all part of the big plan. God is working on, and God is in control. Now, just for a moment, again, can you go back in time? Uh, even further back to the prophets. Imagine you're a prophet, right? God is showing you what he's going to do in the future. 
You can see Jesus' suffering. You can see his glories. You know that the Son of God is coming to earth and die for mankind. You can see God's salvation plan. You can see the outpouring of God's grace. But all this is not for you now. That's for the prophets, by the way, not us. But the future generations to come, that's us. Now imagine that you know you have only been shown part of the picture. That would really pique your interest. But also I can imagine it's a bit frustrating as well. Knowing that the great things to come. But now think how blessed you are. Because we are living in a time that sees the results of the outpouring of God's grace. I know we don't know everything. But by studying God's word we can know a lot. But these prophets of old knew it had been hidden from them. Things like we see in Ephesians 3, 4 and 6. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. To excuse the H. Members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. And this is in 2 Timothy 1.10. And which now has been manifest through the appearing of our saviour Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the Gospels. Now these things now have been heard by you, by the preaching of the Gospel, the things the prophets had written about long, long ago. And we can, we can hear them now, here today, are the words of the prophets that the prophets knew were for future generations. Now on top of all this salvation is something that angels desire to look into. And that word look, it has a meaning of the angels bending down, of looking with intense interest. Their desire to look into God's unfolding eternal plan. It's not something God has stopped them from doing. He's encouraging them to look and see what is happening. Now, but think about that. Eh? Angels are watching us all the time to see what we're doing. Eek. Now, I bet you're all thinking... I hope they weren't looking at such and such a time and such and such a time. But they most probably were. The angels can see God's wisdom by playing, being played out through his work in the church. The concept seems grounded in Jesus. Jesus' words is from Luke 15, 7 and 10, where angels are said to rejoice of a one repentant sinner. Luke 5, 15, 7 says, Just so, I can tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And Luke 15, 10, Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So every time somebody repents because the angels are watching, 
they rejoice. So just to wind it up, it's a bit weird not having the clock there, but fortunately I've got it on top of my screen. So the in conclusion, let us remember that this world and the way it works is not for us. We are but travellers in this world and should be separated from its ways. Wherever we live, we can call our temporary home. But ultimately, our home is with Jesus. We have seen how all three of the Godhead are at work in our lives. We are elected by the Father beforehand to be sanctified by the Spirit for obedience and finally sprinkled of the blood of Jesus Christ. Without all three working in our lives, we cannot belong to the heavenly realms. People cannot pick and choose. Oh, I'll have those two, I don't want that one. It needs to be all three to get the full experience they offer. And what a wonderful way of, of greeting each other. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. What a wonderful greeting to give anyone. I might try that, so what response we're getting in. God has shown us his great mercy by giving us a living hope. In the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, this hope is not something new, but prophesied by the prophets of old. And remember, it is looked into by the angels, and you're being looked upon as well. So, thank you for listening. I was, uh, I was praying that uh, I could preach in the power of the Spirit. I'll be praying that I can operate in the power of the Spirit. And I would recommend that maybe you pray that as well. Because we need to operate in the power of the Spirit. We want the gifts of the Spirit. You can imagine that, eh? Somebody prophesying, somebody healing. We've already got teachers, we've got preachers, etc. We've got quite a few of the gifts. But it's the supernatural gifts that we really... I think this church would... Yeah. Right. Over to you.